Okay, so we're going to be looking at Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 and looking at them as a unit. And we're going to be following the threads or the themes. The first theme that I want to look at is actually who is Jesus in Revelation. Chapter divisions were not in the original Bible. There were no chapters, there were no verses that were uh, put in any of the scriptures. And that's something that people added much later on after our Bible was compiled. The downside of having chapter divisions is that we tend to place um, certain sections of scripture in their own little group. And we think, you know, if we can just do the chapter, we'll understand what that chapter means. When a chapter is actually a part of a larger uh, body of work. And you've got to know kind of the whole thing in order to understand any part of it. So Revelation is sort of broken down by, um, you know, most people who teach it and commentaries and so on. Uh, as chapter one is its own thing, that's when Christ appears to John. And then you have the letters to the seven churches, which are in chapters two and three. And then you have the rest of Revelation, uh, beginning with chapter four and a door open in heaven and John goes up and there's the 24 elders seated before God's throne. And, and then that continues up through uh, the second coming of Christ, which is uh, Revelation 19 and 20. And then we have the eternity part of Revelation, which would be basically from 20, 21, and 22. And that's kind of how the book is broken up. And then there are these little places in the book that everybody knows they're out of order. Okay, everybody knows that. Chapter 18 is out of order. Um, there's a lot of uh, strange uh, chapters that people call interludes, and uh, all, all of that's artificial. There needs to be a way to think about it, um, you know, so people do chapters and so on. The problem with that is then our interpretation of the passages is more inclined to follow what we see in a chapter and we have a really hard time thinking outside of that chapter box. What I'm going to do today is help you a little bit with understanding how to take a more um, layered look at the book of Revelation, which, by the way, this is the Hebraic perspective. And remember, Revelation is written in the Hebraic style with imagination and dragons and, and imagery, symbols, uh, referencing uh, other passages in the scriptures. Very different from the Greek way of viewing things, which is this very logical, very linear, you know, we've got one timeline that's going through something and we logically and rationally deduce things. Well, all you have to do is think about it. How do you fit a dragon with seven heads and ten horns into a logical, rational system? You don't. So you have to start thinking in another way, which is basically what they do in the movies. It's very creative. It's going to be broken up. You have to trace characters. You have to trace events. You have to use your imagination to connect things together because not everything is going to be spelled out for you in a nice, neat, um, tidy way like a math problem or a science experiment. This is something else. This is more like art <laughs> or English literature or, you know, cinema or something. So you have to kind of change your way of looking at the book. Okay, so we're going to be looking at Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 and looking at them as a unit. And we're going to be following the threads or the themes. The first theme that I want to look at is actually who is Jesus in Revelation. How is he identified? How uh, how is this identification expanded on when we read the letters to the seven churches? I'm sure all of you have noticed who, who have you know done any 
study in Revelation at all. You've got these letters to the seven churches. Every church sort of starts out with something about Jesus. The words of the first and the last, the one who died and came to life, uh, the, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. There's uh, seven different sort of beginning parts to each of the letters that tell us something about Jesus. And they're building on that identification of Christ that we read about or we read about in chapter 1, where John turns to hear the voice that's speaking to him. And he sees a man, one like a son of man walking among seven golden lampstands. He's got hair like wool, face like the sun, a sword coming out of his mouth. Of course, none of this is literal. It's all symbolic. And it refers us to uh, back to Daniel, which is what those last two videos were that I did on, on this person that we see in Daniel chapter 7, chapter 10, and chapter 12, who is the angel of the Lord, who is Christ before he became a man, his pre-incarnate appearances in the Old Testament. In addition to Christ appearing as this one who delivered this message of prophecy to Daniel in the Old Testament, Jesus is appearing as this same angel, the same messenger, and remember angel and messenger, same Greek word, same Hebrew word. He is appearing as this same messenger only now, instead of appearing to Daniel, he's appearing to John, and he's delivering a message. And in this larger message of the book of Revelation, there are some shorter messages that he wants communicated to a certain group of people. And that's the people in the letters to the seven churches. Most people, when they teach through um, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, they, they will teach kind of a historical viewpoint. This is sort of the common way people are doing it that, you know, the letter to the church at Ephesus is depicting the apostolic age of the church. And then you have the persecuted church in the letter to the church of Smyrna. And then you've got, you know, the Reformation in one and Catholicism in another. And, you know, and yes, there is kind of a loose correlation, but there's nothing in the book of Revelation that says that this is history at all. In fact, as we dig into this book, you're going to see that this is all applicable to the end times and that the letters were written specifically to one group of people so that they can maintain their called, chosen, and faithful status as a firstborn and gain the inheritance. That's the 144,000 of Israel. That is who the letters to the seven churches are, are, were written to. You know, as we get into this, you're going to see how that's the case and that this artificial historical viewpoint is just that. It's artificial. It's, you know, it's something to talk about. It's a way to think about Revelation, but it's, it's so lacking in good, solid interpretation that really you just need to take it and just just basically set it aside. If you want to keep it after you've listened to my um, Bible study on this, well, go ahead. You can take that back and you can have that be your interpretation. Let's think together about this. Let's think about it in a different way. What's interesting to me is people are always watching YouTube videos and listening to the latest prophecy and, you know, just on the edge of their seat about all kinds of things. They want something new, but they keep listening to the same old stuff again. So you don't get anything new by listening to a rehash of old stuff. You get something new by, you know, breaking out of your traditional, the way we think about it, the way we do things, thinking, and consider at least some other kind of possibilities. And that doesn't mean you have to embrace other possibilities. It just means that you should consider them because <laughs> how else are you going to learn anything new? So that's a rant I may or may not leave in this video. We'll see. So in addition to Christ appearing in Revelation chapter 1 as that um, one like a son of man who is giving this body of information and prophecy to John, same same thing as what happened in Daniel when 
Jesus, pre-incarnate Christ, gave a body of prophecy to Daniel. He is also the steward of God's house. This is one of the main ways that we're going to see Jesus in the book of Revelation. The other way is as the lamb. He's, he's always the lamb when you see him in heaven. He's not always the lamb when you see him present on earth. And he is present on earth for a lot of this. A lot of the stuff that happens in Revelation where we see him, he's not in heaven. He is on earth. Revelation 10 is an example. He's on the earth. Revelation 7, he's on the earth. He's doing these things that correspond to the activities of God's oldest son, who in this case would be the steward of God's house. When Jesus underwent training, stewardship training, the book of Hebrews tells us, is that he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And because of that, he became the heir of everything. And Jesus is God's heir, which means he is the inheritor of God's household. Jesus shares this, um, uh, his inheritance with us. He always has the double portion. He's always going to be the chief steward. Remember in the uh, book of Genesis when God is talking to Abraham about you know, God is going to bless him and, you know, make his descendants like the stars of heaven and so on. And Abraham says, well, I'm not sure how that's going to work out when Eliezer of Damascus is my heir. Okay, how did Eliezer end up being Abraham's heir? Well, Eliezer was the steward of Abraham's house. That's how he would come to become Abraham's heir if Abraham did not have a son. But Abraham did have a son. He had Ishmael first. Ishmael was not the son of promise. Ishmael was a work of the flesh. Isaac was the son of promise. He was the legitimate heir through whom the promises would come to Abraham. So he would become the steward, the inheritor of all of Abraham's household and the one who would be in, entrusted with the promises of God that the lineage of Christ would follow through Isaac. I'm going to mention another passage here. This is in Isaiah chapter 22. We're going to start at verse 20. This is another steward passage. Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. And I will commit your responsibility into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will lay on his shoulder. And he shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. And I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place and he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. He's talking about Eliakim, who is going to replace a wicked servant, a wicked steward named Shebna, and that the robe of stewardship and the belt of stewardship and the, the keys would all go from Shebna to Eliakim. Eliakim has the keys of David. And we read in Revelation chapter 3 that Jesus has the keys of David. We know that anyone who is the chief steward, the one who is basically running everything under the authority of the master, has a couple of things. They have the keys and they have the signet ring. They have the authority that the master gives them and it, the ring is what gives the son the authorization to use all of the father's resources and authority. There is no angel who will ever be an inheritor. There is no angel who carries all of God's authority. Only Jesus is the firstborn. Only Jesus is the chief steward of God's house. And Jesus has been assigned by God to be over God's household and you and I are part of God's household. The 12 apostles were part of the stewardship that was entrusted to Christ at the beginning of his first ministry. He has a larger stewardship now, which is actually uh, the church. 
And this is what Ephesians tells us in Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Jesus is head over all things for the church. That includes the people who are going to come to Christ once we are gone. That includes the 144,000 who are this second tier of apostles who are going to come to Christ after we are identified as sons and changed from mortal to immortal. And we have seven days of time that will coincide with seven days of the giving of the Holy Spirit to the 144,000 of Israel. And then on the eighth day, that's when our rapture will take place and we'll show up in heaven the eighth day is also when that Joel 2 outpouring will take place on the 144,000 of Israel. Jesus is the steward over all the people. And he is especially um, concerned for those people who are going to be heirs, who are going to rule and reign with him. That is the 144,000 of Israel. There will be um, believers who will be left that aren't a part of that group who's going to be kings and priests and joint heirs with Christ. They're going to be left behind. Um, for whatever reason, they uh, refused to submit to the training that was necessary for, uh, for people to rule and reign with Christ. They, they were born again. They received the Holy Spirit, but then they just decided to walk away and do their own thing to invest themselves in the things of this world rather than things that are part of the kingdom of God. They are going to be priests, but they're not going to be kings. They're not going to rule and reign during the millennium. Although at the end of the millennium, they will, I believe, regain their double portion inheritance and be a part of that holy city, New Jerusalem, be a part of that larger group of those who are called, chosen, and faithful. So in Revelation chapter 1, we have this description of Christ, face like the sun, he's wearing this long robe, uh, golden sash, his eyes are like fire, he's got seven stars, he's got a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, and you can read that in Revelation chapter 1. But Revelation chapters 2 and 3, um, prefacing every single letter to each of the seven churches, tells us more about Christ. So in the letter to the church of Ephesus. Uh, we read this. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Okay, the seven stars. I believe that's glorified people. The stars are, are, are saints. They're people who are in their immortal bodies. And I believe they will have <clears throat> received the glory that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, where star differs from star in glory. We're talking about glorified, raptured people who are present with Christ, walking on the earth among the seven golden lampstands. Okay, the thing about stars and lampstands is they both have light. The stars have their own light, the lampstands carry the light of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to people who are born again. And the, the two witnesses, they are also called lampstands. Why are they lampstands? Because they have the Holy Spirit. Anybody who has the Holy Spirit is a, a light. And when you have a bunch of lights gathered together in an assembly, you're like a little city on a hill. You are cannot be hidden, okay? You, sh you share the light of the glory of God wherever you go, and that comes from the Spirit of God within you. People who are among the 144,000 are going to have the Holy Spirit. Christ is the bright and morning star. We are um, the stars in his hand, and the churches, the lampstands, are the seven churches. And by the way, it's not a literal number. Seven is the number of completion or um, deity or perfection wholeness, um, fullness. And so we've got the fullness of messengers who are going to be going out to the seven churches. We've got the fullness of all those who are going to be a part of that 
144,000. It's not a literal number, 144,000. We're not talking about literal seven churches. We're talking about the people of God from the 12 tribes who are spread out all over the earth, who are going to be given the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit is sent out into all the earth, which is what we read about in Revelation 5. Okay, the Holy Spirit will be sent out into all the earth. We're not talking about, um, it's not literal here. There's not a literal seven churches. But there will be um, groups of people of among the 144,000 who will assemble together. And they will sometime between our glorification, you know, our rapture and glorification, and when the 10 days of tribulation starts, uh, during that period of time, there's going to be glorified saints and Christ on the earth delivering the message to these people. There's things that these people are going to be doing well, and there are things that um, they have to watch out for, and mostly they have to watch out for harlot infiltration. And this is going to be a big topic that I'll talk about in another video. Harlot in infiltration, that is Balaam, and Jezebel, uh, these are a couple of uh, types that we see that are going to try to infiltrate this, you know, first tier of apostolic groups that are going to basically be all over the world. And the things that Christ tolerates, like right now in the church, the harlot infiltration in the church right now is sort of tolerated by Christ, won't be tolerated after we're gone. That harlot infiltration will have to be totally and utterly rejected. And we'll talk about that more in another video. So in the letter to the church of Ephesus, we read that... The, Christ is going to be here with his messengers, the seven stars representing glorified people who will be ministering to different assemblies of the 144,000 of Israel. God's plan is that Christ is the chief steward and that he, along with his under stewards, of which we are because we're elders, remember, among the 24 elders who are assistants to Christ, uh, we're going to spiritually warn, encourage, bless, exhort, and so on, so that these end-time assemblies, these end-time people, will actually retain their inheritance. That's the goal. So what else do we learn about Christ in the letters to the seven churches? We learn that uh, in Revelation 2.8, that this is the letter uh, to the church of Smyrna, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. This here introduces the idea that Jesus is at the beginning, he's the alpha, he's at the end things, he is the one who died and came to life. So we know this is Jesus. He is someone who died and came to life. And the letter to the church of Smyrna is written to those people among this last apostolic group. And it's during this period of time when this group is present on earth, this apostolic group, that the harlot is going to conduct a 10-day purge. And the letter to the church of Smyrna describes this purge that's going to be taking place. And the reason why it's, it's important that Jesus calls himself the one who died and came to life is because these people are going to die, a lot of them, not all of them. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The ten days of tribulation is going to affect basically all believers who are on earth, including the 144,000, you know, symbolic, those uh, from the 12 tribes of Israel. And millions and millions and millions of believers are going to be killed. That's that great multitude that nobody can number standing before the throne in Revelation 7. And they're in white robes. They're priests to God. And the people that we see in Revelation 7, they are priests. They're not kings. They're not seated on thrones. They don't have crowns. They're not said that they're going to rule. The faithful 
144,000 who are killed during this 10 days are going to be both kings and priests. And what Christ is doing is he's assuring them that even if some of them do die, that they are not going to lose that crown. They're not going to end up just as being a priest in God's heavenly throne room. They are also going to keep that crown and they are going to be resurrected. So later on, when we read in uh, Revelation here, we read that there is a promise of Jesus coming in what I'm calling a rapture event for every church except for that group in Smyrna that that letter to the church of Smyrna is addressing. But what Jesus is saying is that some of the people among that 144,000, if they die, it's okay. They're still going to keep their crown. And those who overcome are told they will be taken in their own rapture. I want to just go over the rapture verses for the 144,000. The letter to the church of Ephesus. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to come to you and you need to overcome. You need to do the stuff that you were doing at the first. And if you don't, I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. He's not telling them they're going to lose their salvation. They're going to lose something, though. They're going to lose their position. They're going to lose their position as firstborn. They are a part of a group that is has been called to be kings and priests. And if they do not do what Christ is t asking them to do, they're going to lose that position when Jesus comes. They will not be taken with him. In the letter to the church of Pergamum, Revelation 2, 15 and 16. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, and if not, I will come to you soon. Revelation 2, 25, the letter to the church of Thyatira. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The letter to the church of Sardis. Revelation 3, 3. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Revelation 3, 10 and 11, the letter to the church of Philadelphia. Because you've kept the word of, about my patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. I'm coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Revelation 3.20 is uh, Jesus talks about him coming. And rather than just using the words, I'm coming or I'm going to come or I'll come to you soon. He says this, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And later in uh, Revelation chapter 4, we learn that there is a door that's opened in heaven. Jesus has a door and he's wanting access to them so that they can have access to him in heaven. So these are the passages that talk about Jesus coming. Now here's the deal. If Jesus is coming for the people in the letter to the church of Philadelphia, what does it mean that he's coming in all of these other letters? The letter I will come to you in the letter to the church at Ephesus, hold, hold on to what you have until I come. Letter to the church at Thyatira, I will come to you soon. Letter to the church of Pergamum. It's consistent. If Jesus means that he's coming before the hour of trial, and by, way, by the way, the hour of trial is a literal hour, the hour, day, month, and year of the sixth trumpet, the hour that the harlot is destroyed on a single day, a single hour. Okay, this is talking about the second woe, which will take place on the same day as the abomination of desolation. It's the end of World War III. It's when a third of the earth is destroyed. Jesus said, if these people will hold on, he will keep them from the hour of trial that comes on the whole earth to try those who dwell on the earth. Jesus wants this group of people, this those who are chosen and called, this first tier apostolic group, to understand that there is a deliverance for them if they remain faithful. 
if they overcome. Jesus is also telling them what the timing is for their uh, rapture. Okay, so what I've got here is a timeline, just kind of a, a rapture timeline here. Uh, I've got the Revelation 12 sign that actually puts us in the book of Revelation. We're not in tribulation because tribulation kind of isn't a thing. Revelation never talks about a seven-year tribulation. We really don't know exactly when our um, change from mortal to immortal will take place. It's uh, sort of up in the air. Could be this year, could be next year. So 2022, 2023. I would theoretically push it out as late as the fall of 2024, but I think that's really pushing it. I think this year, next year, and that's my thinking on it in order to stay within the fig tree generation. And so if the rapture takes place this year, then the second coming would be in 2026. If the rapture is next year, then the second coming would be in 2027. All right, so uh, if you're interested in seeing some more of my timelines, uh, uh, you can get the PDF. The link to that is in the description. It's a kingdom of priests, the timeline template or something like that. Okay, so there's going to come a moment in time after a war in Israel, after the woman, Israel has gone into travail, when believers who are going to be kings and priests, heirs, heirs of Christ, notice I'm not calling it the bride. The bride does not exist, is not all assembled or put together until uh, till the end, until after the millennium. But we're, we are changed from mortal to immortal here on earth. During this time, we're going to be uh, under stewards working with Christ to uh, seal the 144,000. He is the angel from the rising sun who has the signet ring, the authority from God to seal people in the Holy Spirit. And he tells those four trumpet angels, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. The servants of our God is the 144,000 of Israel in this case. So that will happen over seven days. Seven, um, Satan is going to want to try and uh, prevent that from happening. It's not going to work. On the eighth day, uh, we are the son who is uh, brought into God's presence. And it's on that same day that the Holy Spirit is sent out into all the earth. That's the Joel 2 outpouring on the 144,000. So like the apostles who were sealed in the Holy Spirit on the same day Jesus rose from the dead, they're going to receive that second impartation that the disciples got on Pentecost, these guys are going to get on the eighth day. And then there's going to be a period of time. And it's about six months from the time that we are, you know, all this takes place, which is over the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, if not this year, then next year. And there's about six months or so until the spring feast stuff happens. What these people are told is that it's during this six-month period of time, and remember, uh, the pit will be opened, all, all those fallen watcher angels will be on the earth, a third of Satan's fallen angels from heaven will be on the earth. It's going to be a very horrible time. The seals uh, 1 through 4 will already have been opened. Uh, trumpets 1 through 5 will have already taken place. So we're talking it's a super hard time here. And it's going to be really bad in certain places on the earth and then not as bad in others. So And, and then there are some places on earth that may not be really affected much at all because the seals affect a fourth of the earth and the trumpets affect a third of the earth. Okay, so... There's going to be a period of time here during which all these bad things are happening. And then there's going to be this 10 days uh, of persecution. This is when the harlot is persecuting believers. It's after this time right here that the beast begins to persecute Israel and believers. The woman's other offspring, not firstborn offspring, but her other offspring and, and the nation of Israel. That happens right here. It's the 42-month reign of the beast right there. So the harlot is the one who's drunk with the blood of the saints over this 10-day window of time. If the 144,000 are faithful 
firstborns, so they're going to have the same pattern, seven days with an eighth day, which means there's going to be seven days where they're immortal and they'll be taken up on the eighth day, which in this case would be first fruits. Okay, this is the same day the two witnesses are going to be uh, killed. It's the same day that Satan is cast out of heaven. He's cast out right here. So technically, um, just from looking at this again, the war in heaven probably will only last these seven days right here because Satan is going to be here casting some of these people into prison. It says that, that the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. What that leads me to believe is that Satan may be here on earth during these three days and then go into heaven for a seven-day week-long war. Okay, so that's kind of a little bit of fine-tuning there. Um, but the war in heaven is going to correspond to what's happening here on the earth. That is sort of a reflection of, you know, what's going on. It may be that the war in heaven actually starts at the beginning of the 10 days and while Satan is here on the earth. Um, and then he goes up to, you know, battle it out with uh, Michael and Michael's angels. Okay, some of the 144,000 will die during this three-day period of time. Remember, other people who are not among the 144,000, they're going to be killed and they're going to uh, show up in heaven right here. These are the um, martyrs. Um, they're the fifth seal martyrs. They're in heaven, and we read about them in Revelation 12. They're the ones that are already in heaven when Satan is cast out. They see him being cast out, and they're rejoicing because he isn't there anymore. All right, so Satan is cast out right here. He stands on the sand of the sea waiting for his fake son to rise from the dead, which is what's going to happen there. So over here is uh, about the time it's on um, Passover that the beast is going to be killed and I think it's the two witnesses who are going to do that. They're going to kill him and then this will be the end of 1,260 days for the two witnesses. You'll notice I don't really talk about the two witnesses here because their their ministry doesn't have anything to do with us. Not really. It doesn't have anything to do with us. I have a very long article. I think it's right around 60 pages that I've written and I've done an hour long video on the two witnesses. And so if you're interested in who they are and how I see that all playing out, um, you can check out the video and read the article. Some of the 144,000 will die here. They'll be put in prison. If they're put in prison and they're not killed, uh, right about here, they're going to become immortal and just be able to walk right through those prison doors. Uh, those uh, chains will fall off of them. Whatever is happening to them in prison, is they're going to be released. And they're going to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. I think Jesus will be here on earth during this seven days because Satan is up here in heaven. Okay, so on this day here on First Fruits is when this group of faithful overcoming uh, believers among the 144,000, they'll be taken in their own rapture. This is before the hour of trial. And remember, the second woe only lasts one hour. It's one hour on a single day. And this is a day that's in God's appointment book. This is for the destruction of this present world system and all the people who control it. Somewhere over here, Satan and is going to be on the earth standing before the woman and his angels are going to be here too. A third of his fallen angels will be with him. And I think they are going to actually be on the earth for most of this time, most of this period of time. Uh, and there's reasons why I think that and the reasons why are in some of the letters to the other seven churches that Satan is actually going to have a throne here on earth somewhere that he is going to kind of be operating from. And so Jesus is going to be coming here to earth along with some, I don't think all, of his kings and priests, the stars, glorified saints who are in his hand, who are his assistants, his elders, just like Moses had 70 elders. Jesus has people who assist him, just like we're going to assist him in sealing the 144,000. 
some of us as the stars in Jesus hand are going to come to earth before these 10 days of trial before these 10 days of persecution happen and it's during this period of time that we're going to be encouraging the people to whom the letters to the seven churches were written okay so the uh, the stars will appear here sometime I'm just gonna put seven churches the information in the letters to the seven churches are going to be applicable right over here between the time when these people are filled with the Holy Spirit and before the 10 days of trial takes place. It's over a period of, you know, about six months, less than six months. There's a third rapture. This is the one that Paul talks about, about those who are alive and remain or those who survive until the coming of the Lord. And remember, the coming of the Lord is the second coming at the seventh trumpet and and this is a day that nobody knows the day or the hour and it's when the day of the Lord starts and that's when the wrath of God is and that's a the third rapture okay and that's the one that Paul's talking about those who are alive and remain or alive and survive after the you know, during this time of trouble, during the reign of the beast. And remember, the tribulation of those days of, of the reign of the beast is cut short. So it's, it's less than uh, three and a half years. Less than three and a half years. The, the tribulation of those days is cut short. And the, then there's the third rapture on that unknown day when the day of the Lord begins. Okay, so um, that's my first installment on the letters to the seven churches we're going to talk about a few other things about who is Christ in the letters to the seven churches and we're going to talk about the the things that Christ is no longer going to be tolerating in his assemblies um, after, once we're taken into heaven and these people are given that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit this is the Joel out pouring of the Spirit before the great and terrible day of the Lord over here. Okay, over here, the day of the Lord, wrath of God, that the sun will go dark and the moon will turn to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And that we know is the sixth seal right here. I'm going to just mention something else here. A lot of people will say, well, the church is not mentioned after Revelation chapter 3, and I know I've said this so many times before. The church, the way we think about the church as in all believers everywhere that comprise the body of Christ, that is never talked about in Revelation like that. We're talking about churches, um, plural, assemblies, groups of people, like small groups that meet in someone's living room or, you know, some place it's a group of people that's the churches and there's lots and lots of churches um, there's seven symbolic churches or seven symbolic assemblies in Revelation but they are not the church okay and this is where you know you get that Greek um, thinking that it's a Pauline idea that you know, the church, you know, universal, comprised of all believers through all time. That is not a thing in Revelation. Okay, churches are assemblies. They're small groups of people who meet together. So we do see small groups of people meeting together in Revelation, but it doesn't mean that the church is gone. <laughs> it's not talking about um, an argument from silence the way uh, people uh, want to talk about that is that we don't see the church after you know Revelation 3 well actually you never see the church at all in the book of Revelation okay so leave a comment in the comment section I hope you've enjoyed this kind of a long video um, we'll be doing some more on the letters to the seven churches and especially when we talk about the things that Christ is not going to be tolerating in the uh, assemblies that will be here after we're gone I think will be most enlightening be very challenging it will uh, make some of you mad but I hope you will be brave and you know think outside the box a little bit and 
So till the next video, I pray you have a very, very blessed day. <music>